Okay, our next speaker is uh, Stephen Nipper, and he's running for Secretary of State. So let's give him a big hand as he comes. My name is Steve Nipper. I'm running for Secretary of State. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out. There's other things you could be doing on a Saturday morning. Um, it is Saturday, right? It's hard to tell because I've been running around just so much all over the state. But I wanted to start out just as a plug for the people that I'm running with in office because, you know, I'm new to politics. Um, I ran an earlier city council and it was a local race, but I'm new to the whole state politics and exactly how things go and what goes on behind the scenes. The best thing I can tell you about the slate of people running on our, or my side of the ticket, on the Republican side, is during all the stressful times, during all the happy times, during all the times that polls had us up one way, polls had us down the other way, our whole team has been consistent. Consistent in their attitude, consistent in who, who they are to you is who they are in private. And that says a lot to me because I've met a lot of people, both sides of the aisle, that aren't necessarily like that. But the people that I have been running with for a year now on that slate are the real McCoy. What they're telling you, they're going to do. I know it, that I know it, that I know it. Um, I just wanted to get that out there only because to say that not only are we qualified, because each individual person on there who's running their, for, for their specific, uh, specific office has got the talent to do it, but they also have the integrity to do it. And if they tell you they're going to do something, they will. So I just wanted to get that um, plug from the beginning. Our state is in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's in trouble on so many different fronts, not just financially, but morally. Our state is bankrupt financially and morally. That's right. So, why did I run for Secretary of State? Well, I was an early city council member. And I got elected on a very small platform that was no taxes because I was tired of paying income. I was tired of paying 4% tax every year. And I was the obnoxious guy that would show up to my local uh, council meetings and say, what are you spending my money on? Every year it goes up 4%. I don't see anything running. They never had answers for it. So I said, okay, I'm going to run. So I ran because it's our money. And I don't think any of them took, took me serious. So I ran, and my very first race, and I ran, and my mailers went out, and my mailers listed the people's names who voted for tax increases. Now, if you ever run for public office where you'll have to share it as a community, I would, I would say don't do that, because it was a very hostile environment once I got elected. But it was okay. Because they understood where I stood. I didn't have to pretend to be anybody. There was no, there was no mystery or no 500-pound um, gorilla in the room. They knew exactly who I was, where I stood. At the same time, they thought, well, we're going to give him a little trick. Or we're going to trick him a little bit. And we're going to give him any committee appointment he wants. So I said, okay, great. I'll be on the finance committee. They said, great. Have at it. And the mayor pulled me aside and he said, good luck. All eyes are watching. Great. Second or third month after I started meeting with all the department heads, I noticed the people in our local city had no idea what they were doing with this money. They had no business training. Most of them, I mean, bless their hearts, they wanted to serve. They served. But they really didn't have any practical skill set to spend other people's money. So I started asking the police chief questions like, why are so many police officers leaving our town? And he would say, well, they're getting a better deal. I said, well, do you understand how much it costs us to hire these people? Not only hire them, train them, send them down to Eastern Kentucky University, come back up, and then they leave our city. And he said, well, you know, there's always a returning pool. Okay. So that was my first obstacle that I took. And I said, I think we should give the police officers a raise because all the neighboring cities were not competing well. And they laughed. Oh, uh -huh, you know, where are we going to get the money for that? You want to cut taxes. Glad you asked. I started going down line by line on different changes we could make. First thing that I did is I said, we need a fleet maintenance plan. Our city had no fleet maintenance plan, meaning anytime the police or the police chief or the fire chief wanted a brand new truck, or a, they would just go to the council and say, we need a new truck. Approved. Boom. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. 
They weren't even using the manufacturer's warranty on most of the cars we had that would service our cars. So we put that into place. Then we started making even smaller tweaks. Like I asked them to buy their salt for the winter in June. They said, why would we buy salt in June? I said, because nobody else is. And there's not snow on the ground and it's cheaper. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> they did that. Then they started making small other changes. And sooner or later, they started thinking, maybe this guy isn't so bad after all. It came time to come down to the budget, and I had campaigned on no taxes. Pulled me into the room, and they said, with all the cuts that you've done and all the raises that you've given the police officers and everything, we're just not 100% sure we're able to go unless we take that 4%. Now, we need you to agree to take that 4% tax increase. I think we can justify it. I said, no, I'm not going to. I said, why? I said, because I gave my word. I told people I wouldn't. I ran on that. I'm not going to do it. So the mayor pulled me in his office and he said, uh, and at the time, he was the president of the Kentucky Bar Association. And he was a very good prosecutor. And he sat me down and he said, you need to tell the citizens of Erlanger what police officer we're going to fire or what street we're not going to clean or what garbage we're not going to pick up because you don't want to take a 4% tax increase. He said, that's all on you. I said, Blame it on me then. Just blame it on me. I'll take full responsibility. He said, okay. I said, Mayor, you know both of us are running against the audit. We're waiting for the auditors to do our final budget. And however that comes back, I said, I know where I stand. Do you know where you stand? He said, absolutely. It's been nice working with you. You're gone. I said, okay. So two days later was the vote for um, to, for the county or for the city tax. And the auditors came back. They said, who's been doing your budget? A couple people snickered, and they said, well, you know, we've had a new guy, a new council member. He's a little wet behind the ears. He's, he's probably messed it up a little bit. The guy said, can I meet him? I said, yeah. This guy pulls me in. These are fascinating changes. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> These people got a raise. The fire department, the police chief, suddenly I became their best friend. I'm giving them more money. They had more equipment. They were able to buy new guns that they haven't been able to buy for a while that we needed, we desperately needed, with the access we have to the highway system. But the funniest thing was they said, we don't want to release yet the numbers, but you guys are in really good shape. You're probably one of the best cities in northern Kentucky in financial shape. I said, well, that's great. Without a beat, the mayor pulled me back in his office and said, I got the report, but we still need the 4%. I said, why in the world would you take 4% if, we're, if we have a surplus? Well, we don't know how much yet. And we just want to make sure because, you know, lean times are coming. we got to store this away. I said, I'm still not going to do it. He said, fine, your vote's going to be 11 to 1. Or it's gonna, I, I told him it's going to be one vote versus if we have 12 council members plus the mayor gets his vote. I said, if I have to stand alone, I'll stand alone. I said, well, Mr. Mayor, I have a big mouth. I said, <laughs> as you can see, I put on my cards who voted for the tax increase. I said... I'm going to do it again. And he said, well, it's been nice working with you, Mr. Nipper. I said, okay. Thursday, we came in for the vote. We stood up. He said, we're going to vote on the budget. He said, how many are in favor of, you know, the tax increase? Nobody stood, nobody said a word. <laughs> they looked at me and he said, okay, it passes then. We're not going to take the tax increase. We're not going to do this. We're not going to, gave me everything I wanted. I didn't say a word, I didn't squawk, I didn't say anything. He took credit, and that's fine. But it proved my point that big changes, big doors swing on little hinges. I want to do the same thing for Kentucky. It's from the Secretary of State's office. People were asking me, why in the world would you run against Allison Grimes? She has $40 million campaign Senate campaign office. Yes, she does. So what? I said, what does her character, what has she done for us? They said, well, well, yeah. doesn't matter. Money is what matters in politics. I said, I don't believe so. I think the people in Kentucky can see through it enough, and I can see it. And people, even in my own party, were saying, Steve, you're crazy. You need to head your head again. Well, here we are, nine days out. They're scrambling on their side. I mean, it's me, a handful of my friends. I granted, we're IT folks. We, we, can, we can stretch a dollar like nobody's business. And we've given her a run for her money. But folks, I'm telling you, I see the momentum. 
I see the passion in people. Yeah. I see how people alone on issues that, to me, directly affect the Secretary of State's office, and I'll, I'll talk about a social issue too. Yeah. But in every avenue, whether it's honesty, whether it's just explaining to somebody, hey, I'm running for this office for this reason. Everybody in our ticket can cite, I'm running for this office because uh, my Carmen, you know, I'm, my background's in auditing, I've done this, I've had this success. Allison Ball, I'm a prosecutor, I've done a deal with financial thing, I can do this with the treasurer's office. All of our messages are mending into the same thing. It's not intentional. I mean, it wasn't on purpose. It just happened that way because we already think that way. Yeah. We think in unison. We travel in unison. People don't understand. Every time I see you, you're with Matt Bevin or, or Allison Ball. Yes, they're great people. They're going to change our state. Our resources alone, our coal, you know, whoever, I know who it was, and I know why it's done, but whoever thought it was a great idea to declare war on coal in our state, hello, I mean, industry loves Kentucky because of our low energy cost. Right. It's the principal manufacturing. I mean, if I'm a business owner, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and look, well, what's the cheapest way to do business? So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so I'll tell you now why I'm running for Secretary of State. I'm running for Secretary of State because I noticed 18 of our counties have more registered voters in them than we do citizens. And that troubles me. <laughs> One of my friends said that his parents, lifelong Republicans, voted Republican their whole life until they died. Then they voted Democrat ever since. <laughs> I'm sorry? My friend said that his parents voted lifelong Republican their whole lives until they died. Oh. Then they voted Democrat. <laughs> we laugh, but we all know it's, it's, true. it's true. Yes, it is. That's it is. right. <laughs> I have been excoriated by the Louisville Courier Journal from every liberal newspaper in the world about I'm trying to disenfranchise people to vote. I said, that's fine. If they want to perjure themselves, that's fine. But when I'm Secretary of State, if they perjure themselves, they'll go to jail. And everybody thought, oh, okay. <laughs> but I took it one step further and I said, fine. You don't want to do it that way? You're going to fight me on every step of the way and call me everything but Father Christmas? That's fine. I'm going to uh, take some of my skills I learned in the IT world and apply them to our voting registration. Because it's really a problem. I mean, if you look at it that way, it's a process. It's a workflow process. People vote, the votes are counted, tallied. There's a way, there's a methodology to do it. Same with the registration. I went and I talked to Secretary of State John Houston, who's in Ohio, he's become a really good friend of mine. And we both, he's a great Christian man. We hit it off. He told me that they just conducted an audit in their state. I said, I want to do the same in mine. He said, if there's any state in the union that needs it, it's yours. I said, yes, it does. Mm. And he started showing me that they, they don't have the evidence because they don't have the data on the Kentucky side, but they do have one person that they caught in Hamilton County who was voting consistently in Campbell County, Kentucky, and then going up to Hamilton County and voting in Ohio. And they don't have the empirical data from our side yet. But I know that there is fraud going on, even if it's just that one case. That's enough. We can do it efficiently. And it's going, to have, it's going to be done with all the federal regulations and everything done because John Houston just did it. He shared it with me, and I'm going to bring it to Kentucky. Now, that's great, and I think it will do two things at once. It's going to encourage people to actually become more integrated. They want to, they'll, they'll want to go out and vote once they know that what they're voting for is at a clean slate. I'm now at a foundation where all those people that are voting with me are supposed to be on it. That's fine. There's no funny business going on anymore. In Kentucky, I'll be honest with you, you can't stop anybody from voting. And that's fine. So what I did is I built a back-end process that's going to match up with databases. And when we're done, anybody and their brother can come vote. That's fine. Come on in. But it's like my dog. You can come into my house. My dog will let you in. But he won't let you leave. <laughs> in other words, if you want to perjure yourself, that's fine. You're going to get in trouble for doing it. And we're going to have clean records from the beginning, so we'll know who's who in the zoo. There's no way around it. 
up, it'll match up with Motor Voter re uh, Records. It'll match up with everything, and we'll have all the documentation to do it. So if somebody wants to sue me, which I'm sure they will, that's fine. We'll have an answer for every single one. Second thing is business. Our state can be so much more than it is now. There's no doubt in my mind. I think people of Kentucky have been conditioned because we've had one party rule for a very long time. Now, I've spent a lot of time in a country that's one party rule, and that's China. And I made the mistake when I first visited China to think, great, look how Western China's become. And I remember telling my wife, look, oh, we're actually having an influence. When I went back again in 2012, it's just the opposite. We're becoming more like China. China is not becoming more like us. The same conditional thought process is going on with the people of Kentucky. We've always been this way, and we've always been 47, 46, 48. Baloney, we don't have to be. I visited Plano, Texas when it was an agrarian society, or it was an agrarian place. You go to Plano, Texas today because of Ross Perot. Ross Perot brought his server farms, bought his uh, IT manufacturing, everything down there. The people of the town who were not IT professionals, guess what? Learn skills. They got out of trouble. Now they're competing with Silicon Valley. We can do the same thing like that in eastern Kentucky. Trust me. We can bring server farms. There's plenty of businesses that would love to come and be in eastern Kentucky. Because, again, our coal costs extremely low. Make energy really low. But we need people in office who understand it. The Democrats do not understand it. It's just... It's what they do. And I'm not trying to be unkind to them. I, they just, by definition, they do not understand it. It's foreign to them. It's like the people on Rollinger City Council who didn't understand it. That's just the way we did it. How it works, we take the 4%, we spend what we want, we do this. It doesn't have to be that way. The third thing, and you know, a lot of people always ask me, how does a social issue like abortion have anything to do with the Secretary of State's office? It's the number one reason that I really wanted to pick the Secretary of State's office. Not only did my skill set match the other parts of it from the business, I'm a business analyst. I've worked for Fortune 500 companies. I've made S&P 500 companies a lot of money doing the same thing that I can do for Kentucky, being an advocate of the state, selling our state, what we have to offer. But also making business transactions easier with our business portal. I've built IT um, business portals for a lot of businesses. You've probably been on a couple of my websites that I've designed. It's it's Something that I just do naturally, but the thing that's close to my heart is actually abortion. And the reason I say that is this. When you think of any state in the union that has the most pro-abortion money coming into it, whether that's from Emily's List, whether it's from Planned Parenthood, whether it's from any of the choices, what state would you say is number one in, in those funds coming in? Just New, York. New York, California. Would you be shocked to know that Kentucky is number two in the United States for contributions? Number two. Now you juxtapose that with the fact that 67% of our population is pro-life. It doesn't make sense. So what's the, what's the answer? The answer is outside influence is coming into Kentucky. I can tell you this, there are unions that are scared to death of this election. There are groups, there are pro-abortion groups, scared to death of our little state's election. And the reason is, is because if Kentucky turns, we'll be the last southern state to then turn and become fully Republican. Let's say we have a landslide victory. All six of us get elected. Amen. But the people are going to hear everywhere. And I think it sets a tone. I think it sets a tone for 2016. I think some of the... They have so much money pouring, pouring in. The unions, every union in this country is pouring money on our opposition side. And it's frustrating them even more longer because they can't do anything with the money. And it's because, again, there's symbolism over substance. Mm -hmm. They can only lie so much and say, we're going to do this or run negative ads so much. I mean, have you seen anything positive from them? I haven't. And like I said, I'm not trying to be a kind. I've asked her. I've asked Allison live on stage. What are you guys going to do? Well, we're better than you guys because, well, then they stop showing up. They just don't come to events anymore. Speaks volumes. Speaks volumes to me. But the fact that we have the opportunity 
to stop people that are taking the largest sums of money, of pro-abortion money in this state, to make sure those people never get to the federal level yeah. where they can really do some damage. Mm. It's how it, in fact, yeah. how it yeah. pertains to me as Secretary of State. I'm huge on deals, and I'll offer a three-for-one <coughs> special for everybody. In one election, we can take out the Lundergrens, we can take out the Conways and the Brashears from Kentucky politics, right. and we don't have to worry about them anymore. It's got to make sure that everybody shows up to vote. Right. Uh, because, like I said, they have unions working for them, and the unions are pushing, going door to door. We're doing our best. We're outgunned. I'll just be honest with you. I'm outgunned 20 to 1. Wow. 20 to 1. But, there again, the polling data shows pretty much dead even. It's going to be close. Turnout's going to be the game. It's really what it is. And um, to be in this position with nine days out, I'm excited. I know my ticket's excited. I spent a um, good portion last night with Matt Bevin. I know Matt's very excited, feeling good about it, but we're not taking it for granted. We're still showing up. We're still spreading our message. Um, I think Kentucky will be a much different place in nine days. Oh, I really do. All right. Your help. Your help and your group's help. I mean, this is a great crowd for a Saturday morning. This is just wonderful. This is just outstanding. And I'm seeing more and more and more and more of this. I've had a lot of people who have uh, been traditionally Democrats, and they didn't even know why they were a Democrat. They were just a Democrat because their parents were Democrats. <laughs> and when they identify and find out that, wait a second, the opposition Republicans aren't such bad guys after all. Maybe they're not everything we've been told. They're more than welcome to the flowers of May. So, um, I thank you all very much. Seriously, please vote. Take, take your children and anybody you can... Yeah, I would say vote early, vote often, but you're not there. <laughs>
and we were at a church, and basically this guy has a five or six foot uh, spinning yard sign and stuff like that for his candidate uh, for his candidate and stuff. And uh, basically, um, we had to kind of argue over that and everything. I, had to, I think I was sheriff at the time and stuff. I had to deal with that. Well. Now they've got it down to about 100 yards or 100 feet, which that means that's like dead in the middle of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So you can go in there and park, and there will be people electioneering to you right there, you know, in the middle of it. And then, you know, not to mention if you even park inside, they're still right there and have to deal with it. And I, and I understand, like, maybe if it's somebody's yard or something like that, but I mean, there's just a lot of these properties that they're doing the, uh, the elections at that have big parking lots. Mm -hmm. And it's just obviously in part of that. Um, I, do you think there would be a way that you could deal with that issue? Or? Well, if it's private property, even if it's within the 100 to 300 feet, then they can do, they can, you can advertise anything you want, to be quite honest, as long as it's obviously good moral standing, but what does that mean today? <laughs> well, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was dealing with the issue specifically, like, like I was saying, it was on the church's property, the church is where they were doing the election. Mm -hmm. And had, a couple members were complaining about it too, they didn't want it. So uh, it, my, my concern is not as much, I, I was saying it's not as much if you got like a close house or something, mm -hmm. but what about, you know, the connected property? Well, <clears throat> honestly, the, the, the sheriff should, or the, whoever is the um, authoritative person to enforce the election laws in that particular county or district or precinct should have been notified if people were in violation because that, you know, you're, you're not allowed to... Um, yell and scream and you know, election year that close to, to a vote in Kentucky, you're just not allowed. So, your, your point's valid. Um, you know, the only thing I would say is if it was private property, it's not a whole lot you can do about it. Praise the Lord for that. Yes, I've often wondered why do we have to have early elections voting because I think that is part of the fraud. Yes, it does. You're absolutely correct. You're out of the yeah. question was, why do we have early voting? The short answer is, it opens up more evidence. There's more variables. If you look at it like a mathematical equation, you're opening it up more variables, more potential for ins, outs, and it's more potential for fraud. It really is. It takes some spinning around of, it, it's, it would move some processes, and when it first started happening, there was a big push for it, and I think most secretaries of state, which I think there's 39 of them now that are Republicans, um, caught on pretty quick. Hey, we need to do something. Ohio being one of them, put some stop gaps in place that says that's fine. You vote as much as you want. You do whatever you want. You're going to get caught if you're deceiving us. But you know, go for it. So now there's not. I think you'll see more of a push away from eh, early voting is not so important anymore. Um, it's developed by the union. That's who really pushed it nationally with the union. So you're right, it is that, but there are measures in place that, that are stopping that. Yes, sir. I want to have you on the radio program. That's my question. <laughs> so you want to have me on the radio yeah, on, on the radio program on 970 on Sunday night? Okay. Three to Sunday night? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, I mean, you can check with me after yeah. I'll give you the information. Yeah, uh, I'll, um, I'll just we'll change the information. Right, right, that's fine. Huh? I was a radio DJ in high school, so I loved it. Oh, do you, do you have a show right now? Nobody no, I, I used to be a disc jockey in, in college. Oh, oh. W, WNKU? So you're going to take my show away? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be top of the hour IDs, though. You know, that'd be pretty cool. Hey, Steve, he's the Black Heart Conservative. He's the Black Heart Conservative. Bless you. Uh, Rick, go ahead and say that question. time again for everybody again. 970. Uh, 970 AM, the answer. That used to be WGTK here in Wool. Uh, it comes out at 7 p.m. on Sunday nights, and uh, we have a good, I try to have fun, I hope everybody has fun. Uh, I need more callers, I know a lot of people listen because they, you know, people recognize my voice, it's amazing to me, but I only got about six or seven people that are bold enough to call me, so <laughs> if y'all can, if we'll, we'll do that, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay, we'll, we'll set it up for some.
carry through to Lexington and Hopkinsville and exactly. other parts because, uh, you know, they, like we have a station here at WLOU uh, that is on the internet and people listen to it all over the state, some sure. like all over the country, actually. Yep. Uh, and, uh, but it's like uh, conservatives uh, are like missing that niche and you wonder why we don't get enough votes. So, if you can, uh, if you can help me hook up with the rest of the candidates, we can, between nine next week, maybe we can get the, uh, 